So I have this question that says, I have QuickBooks Online, and every time I try to create a new account, it's asking me for the detail type of the account. What does detail type mean? How does that affect my accounting? And what is the difference between account type and detail type? So it's a great question, and I'm going to answer it in two parts. First, I'm going to give you the short answer. The short answer is, I'm going to go into QuickBooks Online here and go into the chart of accounts by clicking on accounting, chart of accounts. And then I'm going to click on new, the green button on the top right, and it's going to pop up a new account creation window. Notice that it's going to ask me two questions from the drop down menu. One is the account type and the other one is detail type. So long story short, the short answer is account type matters because the account type dictates what uh, financial report that account goes into. So for example, accounts receivable, other current assets, bank fixed assets, other assets, accounts payable, credit card, other current liabilities, long-term liabilities, and equity. These are all balance sheet accounts. You will notice that when you click on any of these, any of these balance sheet accounts I just mentioned, is also going to ask you an additional question about do you want to enter an opening balance? And that's kind of like the best way to kind of understand which ones are balance sheet accounts and which ones are profit and loss accounts. If I switch it and I pick, for example, an income account or anything under income, income, other income, cost of goods sold, expense or other expense, any of those, you will notice that it won't ask me for a beginning balance. And that's in a nutshell how you know which ones are the profit and loss accounts and the balance sheet accounts. So the account type does matter. And when you pick an account type, it gives you a drop down with a whole bunch of options for a, a detail type. And long story short, whatever you put here doesn't affect your accounting at all. You can put the wrong thing. You cannot know what to put. You can leave the default option that it gives you. And it literally will make no difference in your accounting whatsoever. So if you want the short answer, don't worry about detail type. Ignore it 100%. There are some rare cases in which you need to know what the detail type is because maybe you're merging the accounts and they both need to be the same detail type. That could be a situation where detail type actually matters from a practical perspective. But from an accounting perspective, it means absolutely nothing. So that's the short answer. Now let's talk about the long answer in which I explain what every one of these options mean. So I'm going to click out in a second and go into the chart of accounts. I kind of do the same spiel here. We have all of our accounts that are bank, other current asset, other current liability, fixed assets, all the way down to equity. And you will notice that the very last equity account at some point here, the very last equity account doesn't have a running balance. Right now, these are all zeros because this is a blank QuickBooks file. But you will notice the very last account, equity account, doesn't have a running balance. And that's basically depicting the end or the separation between the balance sheet accounts and the profit and loss accounts. So everything on the retail earnings line and above, those are balance sheet accounts. And anything on the retail earnings line and below, those are profit and loss accounts. If you don't know what profit and loss account and balance sheet account means, I want to get into more detail on each of these accounts, but at least I wanted to uh, set up that premise. Now I'm going to scroll all the way up and then notice that in the header, I can actually sort these by account name, or I can sort them by account number, or I can sort them by a balance. And basically if I sort them uh, by, let's say account name, for example, I'm going to have balances all over the place. I'm not going to have that uh, natural order of things where I have the balance sheet at the top and the profit and loss at the bottom. So that condition uh, of the balance sheet at the top, profit and loss at the bottom, it's only true if this is sorted by detail type in ascending order where you see all the accounts with that running balance, which in your world, those might have actual numbers. And then all the way down to the very last one, written earnings that doesn't have any balance. And that's basically, again, the separation between balance sheet and profit and loss. So I'm going to go and create a new account and I'm going to walk you through each of these choices. So first we have account type bank. That's when you're going to create a bank account or a cash account of any sort. Once you select bank, you're going to have a detail type of cash on hand and you will pick that for like your petty cash account or for like your register. Like if you have a, a cash register, that would be a good for that. If you're going to open a checking account, a money market, those would be good accounts. If you do a, a trust account or a rents held in trust, which are the same thing, the trust accounts or savings, those are your options here. But if I pick money market and I make this my uh, petty cash, which is totally wrong, 
uh, there's nothing will go wrong, like nothing will break because QuickBooks only looks at the account type as the one that matters. So why does detail type even exist? Well, the purpose of detail type is to help new users that don't know what they're doing, create the account and automatically name the account based on their choice. So for example, if I start creating an account and the default account is a bank account and I click on the drop down and I savings, notice that immediately QuickBooks will enter the word savings as the account name and kind of start pushing you or guiding you to the process. Now this could be wrong or this could be right depending on the context. So that's really what, what the purpose of this is. So the purpose is that before you type in a name, if you pick any of these options, it will automatically type it for you. If I type it for me, if, if I put, for example, Bank of America 1234, and then change the detail type, once you um, actually type something and change it, it will rename or rechange the name for you. So you have to be very careful. So the, the workflow is you select the account type first, then, then the detail type, and then you write the name. So those are the bank accounts. Let me go up to accounts receivable. So accounts receivable is one that when you click on detail type, it gives you no additional options. And the reason for that is because QuickBooks only manages one type of accounts receivable. And in the real world, there's only one type of accounts receivable. This is basically all the open invoices that your customers owe you. So anything your customers owe you will go into accounts receivable. And actually you don't have to create your own accounts receivable account. QuickBooks will automatically create this for you the minute you uh, generate the first invoice. So there's no need for you to create additional accounts receivable accounts, but you can if you want to, but it will not be functional from an invoicing perspective. Now let's take a look at other current assets. So a current asset is an asset, which means this is something that belongs to you. Accounts receivable is a current asset as well. And bank is a current asset as well. So those two have already been discussed, but the additional other current assets are all these that show here under detail type. So I'm gonna explain each one. Allowance for bad debt is when you reduce the value of your accounts receivable for a percentage that you probably will not collect for the year in order to post a reduction of income or a potential expense in the future for not receiving the income for uh, the customer. So your business, every business will have an average amount of uncollected invoices that they can never turn to cash, they can never get paid for. And whether that's 10% or 20% or 30%, depending on your industry, your business, your particular circumstances, you will have to allow for bad debt by creating an entry. Now, most small business owners are on cash basis accounting, which means they don't track accounts receivable. And this is really a sort of a moot exercise, but it's there as an option. Now, development costs would be anything you spend to develop a short-term asset. So if you're making investments into something that you're going to get back uh, pretty, pretty short um, or you are you know, some short-term financing or something like that, you can do that. That's always going to be something that you're going to get back in the short term. The general theory is an other current asset. is an asset that you will turn into cash within an operating cycle within a year. So all these other current assets have the same property. Employee cash advances, that's when you pay your employees up front before you write them a, a, a salary check or an hourly check. And at some point, when you write them a paycheck, you're gonna reduce that loan from it. So that employee cash advance, other current asset account, that's what that would be for. Then you got inventory, and that should be self-explanatory. This would be the value of your inventory. If you track inventory, all your inventory should be in this account called inventory or inventory asset. Also notice that every one of these have an explanation under it. Let's call it a cheat sheet. And that's a really good thing because if you're new to accounting, new to bookkeeping, new to QuickBooks, new to chart of accounts, you might not understand what any of these things mean, especially at a high level, like other current asset. So reading through them helps you understand what encompasses an other current asset. So this detail type becomes like a sort of like a mini database of examples to make it easier for you to choose the correct account name when you're creating them. So investments in mortgage or real estate loans, that would be like you giving money to someone so they can buy a mortgage or you selling uh, a property and selling it with a mortgage and people pay you that principal. So that's gonna be sort of in the, the, the long-term, oh, sorry, on the, on the short-term side, not on the long-term side, because it's another current asset for a long-term uh, loan that would be under uh, long-term liabilities, which we'll explain in a second, or the 
other assets, uh, which we'll explain in a second. Then we have investment tax uh, exempt securities. That's again, you bought some bonds, you bought some uh, some um, some uh, local bonds that don't get charged uh, tax or e or income tax, IRS income tax for for that reasons for that purpose. So that's just basically a category of a short term investment in a local government in which you are not going to get taxed on. And again, that's you're just doing that to separate the, the different asset classes you have. Investment in a U.S. government obligation that would be like a T bill or a T bond. These are the treasury bonds, treasury bi uh, uh, bills. And then we have investments other, which would be any of these uh, similar to these that don't fall into this category. Maybe you invested in another business. Maybe your business bought a percentage of another business. That could be an example of one. But again, you have to understand whether it's short term or long term. Current means short term that you wish turn into cash pretty soon. So you want to put on pause the stuff that's going to be uh, collected or turned into cash later on for a different uh, category called other asset, which we'll discuss in a second. Then we have uh, loan to officers, loan to others, loan to stockholders. So if your company is lending money to any of these parties, that would be a great name for an account. Other current assets, that would be like a super generic miscellaneous type of account under this category. Then we have prepaid expenses. This is every time you pay something in advance, you pay it now, but it's going to be spent in the future or it's going to be um, charged as expense or deducted in the future. You're just paying ahead of time because of a contractual agreement or prepaying for XYZ reason. The retainage, that would be when your customers don't pay you the full uh, invoice and they still owe you like a small percentage at the end. So like 5%, 10%. This happens a lot in construction where your customers um, have a, an agreement where they'll pay off your whole invoice, but they'll hold back a retainage. So you being owed a retainage as a construction company, that's an asset. And that's something that you're probably going to get paid back once the construction finishes or whatever the contractual agreement, you get paid that back and that will turn back into cash. On the positive funds, this is a really interesting one. This is the account that you use to store all your customer payments before you get a chance to create the bank deposit. So every time you receive a check or a cash or a payment that's going to go in the bank, probably bundled with multiple payments, you want to put all that stuff inside on deposited funds temporarily. So then you can do one more transaction to make the bank deposit. And that's one area of confusion because on deposited funds is actually not an official accounting term. This is more of a QuickBooks term. And it's a really important one to know because bottom line, many businesses will have that situation where they're receiving payments um, uh, and they're making a deposit of all of them together. So that's other current assets. Let's go down to fixed assets. And the options here are accumulated depreciation, amortization, and depletion. This would be when you take an amortization expense, which is when you reduce the value of an asset over time. Depletion and depreciation, same thing. It just depends on the type of asset. That's where you accumulate a negative asset or a reduction of value of your fixed assets. But the typical fixed assets we think about, we think about buildings, we think about computers, copiers, furniture, phones, that sort of thing. So all the things, physical things, uh, tools, equipment that your uh, business uh, owns, those are going to be fixed assets. And only these accumulated depreciation will reflect the reduction of value of those fixed assets that will take over time for financial reasons or tax reasons for that matter. Then down here, we have intangible assets. This would be like a patent um, or, or, or a trademark, something that you can't physically see or touch, but it has intrinsic value or, or you spend money to acquire it. We got furniture and fixtures. We got land, leasehold improvements. So this is uh, leasehold improvements is investments you make into your office or in your business location. And, um, and you're not taking it as an expense now. It's going to be an asset that you're going to depreciate over time. Machinery and equipment, other fixed assets that would be like sort of the catch-all default miscellaneous account, and then we have vehicles. So long story short, fixed assets are those uh, large purchases of physical things, and in some cases intangibles, that will reduce in value as time goes by via this accumulated or um, accumulated amortization, depreciation, or depletion accounts. So let's go down and pick the next one, which is other asset. And then here we have a couple of really interesting ones. Uh, for example, accumulated amortization of other assets. 
So that's if you have an intangible asset or another asset, and you're going to reduce the value of it over time. So for example, let's say you have something called goodwill. Goodwill is called an, uh, an other asset or an intangible asset. This is the extra cash that you pay for a business when you buy out a business beyond their book value. Let's not get into the details. That's what that would be. Uh, you're reducing that value over time. And exactly what we spoke about, goodwill, that's, that would be that additional value that you pay for a thing or a business uh, that's beyond its fair market value. Then we have the lease buyout. That would be like when you lease uh, a piece of equipment or a truck or let's say a, um, a photocopier. And at the end, there's a, there's a residual value for the lease buyout. You can enter that there. That would be the value of that. Licenses similar to uh, patents or or um, or permits or what's the other one? Um, uh, trademarks. This would be like your ability to use something, your ability to do business, your ability to sell alcohol. For example, you can look at the the examples here. Uh, usually, we uh, amortize the the licenses over time because we get a license that costs us $100,000, whatever, for 10 years. These are uh, uh, things of long-term value. So you don't expense them in one year. They're not an expense. They're an asset. Then we have organizational costs. This would be like your first year of business. All the costs to get your business formed, that would be an other asset, like it's amortized over time. Other long-term asset, that would be like the catch-all miscellaneous for that account type. And then we have security deposit. That's if you move into an office building and they require you to put two months ahead of time and then you get them back when you move out, that's where you would put that. That's where you would track that money that's owed to you. And usually this is long-term, more than a year. So other assets would be all those things, in some cases intangibles, uh, purchases or investments of value that are going to last you probably for more than one year, and you're probably going to depreciate them or reduce the value over time. Then we have accounts payable. It's kind of the brother or the sister of the accounts receivable. This will be all your open bills, your uh, vendor, supplier, invoices that are sent to you that you're going to pay later. You enter those, those accumulate inside of accounts payable account. You don't have multiple detail types to choose. And as I mentioned earlier, just like accounts receivable, accounts payable, they're not really important to have multiple of them. Very rarely somebody would have multiple AR or multiple AP accounts. So a credit card would be similar to a bank in QuickBooks. You're going to enter an actual credit card and notice that there's no additional detail type. It's just credit card. And the credit card would download transactions into that card. Every single individual transaction that you spend on the credit card will be tracked in QuickBooks and you will pay off that credit card with your checking account, making transfers to it. And you reconcile that credit card just like a bank account. So a credit card is sort of its own category, similar to bank accounts. Let's do other current liabilities. These are things that you owe and you probably will pay within a year. So that's basically what, so an other current asset are things you own and you will probably be able to turn into cash within a year. And the current liabilities are things you owe and you probably will turn into, or you will pay them off within the year. So what do you have here? Federal income tax payable. So we pay our taxes every year. So if you're accumulating federal income taxes, that would be a place to put it. Insurance payable. This would be any insurances that, um, that, uh, need to be paid in the future, which you're recording without a bill necessarily, because this will be the same thing as a as a as an accounts payable, uh, because it's got the word payable in it. Then we have line of credit. This would be a short term loan from the bank that you're gonna pay back within a year. So all your line of credits get put in there. Loan payable, the same thing, whether you're paying it to a bank or you're paying it to the owner of the business or to someone that uh, lent the business money. That's what that would be for. Other current liabilities, that's the catch-all account for that account type, other current liabilities. Uh, payroll clearing would be, if you're using a, a, a payroll third-party payroll processor and you need an, a clearing account to move uh, all the balances that are you know, being sent to wages and then taxes, that's a really difficult one to explain without showing it. But long story short, it's a clearing account that gets uh, adjusted to zero at the end and is used to have a temporary place to kind of dump transactions in there while you're reconciling your payroll. Then we have payroll tax payable. This would be anything you owe to the federal government, uh, state or local government. Then we have prepaid expenses uh, payable. This would be like anything that uh, that you need to prepay in the near future. Uh, they, they should use some examples like property taxes that are due, but they're not yet uh, deductible. So for example, 
let's say I need to pay my property taxes for next year and I, and I need to prepay them and put the payable in there so I know that I owe it, but uh, it's not necessarily an expense for this year. Rents in trust liability, that would, be, that would be if you rent property. Okay, so if you rent property, you are a landlord and people give you that security deposit, that would be an other current liability that you probably need to pay off within the year. Or in some cases, it could be a long term. If these are long lease contracts of more than a year. So even though that's in there on the other current liability, that one could be a long term liability as well. Then we got sales tax payable. That would be the account you use to store the amount you owe to the government in sales tax. Then we have state and local income tax payable. Same thing as the federal or the sales tax. Then we have trust account liabilities. That would be the same thing as uh, rents in trust. This would be like for a lawyer that receives uh, money and they're, they're the ones that are a closing company or they're holding money for someone else. This would be like your client's money you're temporarily uh, holding. Then we have undistributed tips. That would be for restaurants that receive uh, cash tips and maybe pay them out at the end of the week or at the end of the month. So that's money that they owe. That's why it's an other current liability. And um, let's do a long-term liability. We have notes payable. That would be a loan, just basically a loan that you owe. Other long-term liabilities, that would be the catch-all account for long-term liabilities. So, in, so if you, again, the catch-all account is if you can't find one that makes sense, you pick that one. That's basically what it means. And then we have shareholder note payable. That's when you owe the owner of the business or a shareholder some money that they injected into the business. Then we have equity. This is the trickiest one. Equity is the account in which the owner interacts with the business. So usually the owner will invest in the business by buying stock. So that's what common stock is. They'll buy stock from the company. Sometimes they will enter things like a partner contribution, a paid in capital. Um, let's see, owner's equity. Let's see which other ones are similar. So we got owner's equity, partner's contribution, and paid in capital. These three here, these three are when the owner puts additional money in the business beyond the initial stocks. And then we have partner's distribution, partner's equity, uh, that's or personal expense. That's when the owner takes money out of the business, either with a cash layout or they use business funds to buy something that's personal. That's all going to be under, under equity, under a distribution type of account. Then we have stuff like personal income. That's if by any chance, by mistake, you deposited a personal paycheck into the business that would go in there, personal income that would be like you uh, uh, using your own personal income to, to, to inject money in the, in the business. Preferred stock, that's similar to common stock. It's just one type of stock. And if you want to separate them, you can do that. Then we have treasury stock. That's the stock that the company owns and the company will sell to new stockholders. And written earnings, that's the one that you probably don't need to create. QuickBooks will create it for you. That's an accumulation of all the net incomes from previous years. You should usually don't need to create a new written earnings account. QuickBooks will have its own written earnings account, but some people like to have multiple for strange personal reasons. Then we have this one called healthcare and estimated taxes. These two are pretty confusing. So in many situations, a small business owner cannot pay the healthcare from their business. So if they end up paying it, then it goes into healthcare, which is the same thing as a personal expense. In other situations, it's sort of a mixture where they pay it through the business, but then do some sort of formula to figure out how much is going to be the business side and how much is the personal side. Either way, that could be an option for entering personal health uh, care type of expenses. When I'm talking about health insurance, health insurance is, for the most part, deductible depending on the context. I'm talking about health care, like paying a doctor or buying medicine or whatever. And then estimated taxes is when the owner of the business owes the IRS or the state taxes and they use the company funds to fund those taxes instead of taking a distribution and then making the estimated payment personally. So that goes into equity. And long story short, equity means everything that the owner puts into the business and takes out of the business, either in cash or as a personal expense. That's simple. That's what equity is. So those are all the balance sheet accounts. Let's move on to the detailed explanation of the, uh, the other accounts. Let's go to income. Notice that there's six choices here. We have discounts and refunds given. So if you want to keep an account for knowing how much discounts you've ever given or refunds, that would be a good idea for that. Nonprofit income, again, that's probably more valuable for nonprofit companies. I hardly ever use that one. We have other primary income that would be 
uh, basically the catch-all account for, for income that, that doesn't specifically fall into these two, sales of product and service and fee. Most of your income as a small business would be sales of product or sales of fee. Everything we do is either a product or a service, right? And then we have unapplied cash payment income. You actually don't need to create this. Uh, QuickBooks will create this for you automatically. And that's every time you receive a payment, let's say at the end of the year, but you don't invoice that client for that payment until the next year. And it shows up as um, income or cash you received that is not applied to an invoice. So it doesn't know what account to put it to. So sort of a temporary account for QuickBooks to book uh, payments without the presence of an invoice. Okay. So those are the, the six categories under income. Let's go to other income. And this would be what's called a non-operating income. These are like accidental sources of income. So for example, dividend, that's if your business owns another business and that business is paying them a dividend because you're typically not in business of owning other businesses. That's why it's sort of extraordinary. Interest earned, that's when you have cash in the bank account or in a savings account or investment account and you're earning interest from that. Or maybe you're lending people money and you're earning interest for that and you're not in the money lending business. Other investment income, that would be, again, anything that you make from investment activities. That's not necessarily operating activities. Then other miscellaneous income, that would be that would be the catch-all from this other income account. And then we have tax-exempt interest. That would be the counterpart of owning those treasury bonds, or not treasury, but the municipal bonds that uh, you earn interest, but they don't pay any tax. You put it in there, so when you look at the financial statement, they're easy to identify, so your tax person can exclude them from the income tax calculation. So let's move on to cost of goods sold. And you're only going to have five categories here. So you're going to have cost of labor, cost of goods sold. These are the direct labor costs for producing the product or producing the service. These are called direct expenses. Then we have equipment rental. Equipment you rented for jobs, for projects. Not the copy machine for the office. Not the uh, vehicle uh, for the office manager. We're talking about the actual equipment that you use on the field with customers completing uh, work for your customers. Other cost of services, that would be any direct cost of a service that's not specifically cost of labor. So it could be like a subcontractor that, that could make sense in there. Then we have shipping and freight and delivery. That, that would be like your direct shipping costs, your direct delivery costs, your direct freight costs that it costs you to bring the product to your warehouse or ship it to your clients. And then we have supplies and materials. That would be any supplies and materials you directly spend for a job. So in a construction company, most of the things you buy at Home Depot or whatever, that would be uh, supplies and materials. So that's cost of goods sold, which are the direct costs used to calculate income minus cost of goods sold and get something called the gross margin. Then we have expenses, which is the biggest of all the categories. So we go through them. But before going through them, let me uh, take a quick pause and show you something. I'm going to uh, click here and go to my website. And I want to click on this article called, called QuickBooks Online Categories Chart of Accounts. And what I actually did is I went into QuickBooks Online and I opened up each of these options, each of them, and I copy and pasted all these descriptions into a spreadsheet, okay? So every single one, copy them into a spreadsheet and loaded them into my website so you can search. So if you go into this link, I'll put it in the link, I'll put, I'll put it somewhere in the description. You can actually search through it. And for example, you're looking for, let's say, a bank fee or some sort, you do Control F, and you type fee, and then you can go through and see all the things that have the word fee in it and see if you can find what you're looking for. There we go. We have an account that's an expense, and it's called bank charges, and that's used for uh, banking charging your fee. So you can use uh, that website, that page, to kind of navigate the same amount of information you see through here without having to go through each one to figure out which one it is. Um, and I do also sell that spreadsheet so you can modify it, clean it up, and then import a ideal chart of accounts that you clean up in Excel. So I'll put a link to that as well if you want to have access to that uh, template spreadsheet with my ultimate chart of accounts setup I use for my clients. Anyway, so let's go through them. So we got the first one, advertising and promotion. This is any money you spend, any money you spend to promote your business, to bring new clients, to, um, to get more eyeballs into your website, all of that stuff. And you have things like, newspaper, radio, social media, uh, Google ads, Facebook ads, all that stuff will go in there. Auto, that would be your vehicle expense. In some cases, 
people break them down and create sub accounts, like a sub account for gasoline, a sub account for the maintenance of the vehicle, a sub account for parking and tolls, uh, that sort of thing, right? So you can have a general category called auto, you can call it car expense or automobile expense or vehicle expense, whatever you want. And then you can create subcategories under it using this little uh, check mark. But that's what the auto category would be. Bad debts would be every time you write off an invoice and you recognize income for that invoice in the past, but now you basically decided your customer will not pay you and you will do the bad debt um, expense. And that will be an expense. And we talked about the allowance for bad debt, which I think is an other current asset. There we go. Uh, this would be like the, the, uh, the, the balancing account for bad debt. So allowance for bad debt would be a reduction of an asset, which is a credit. And then let's go back to expense. And bad debt, let's go to expense. And bad debt here would be the actual expense, which is a reduction of income for not being able to collect on that invoice. Then we have bank charges, which would be any, any bank that charges you fees of any sort. Charitable contributions, this is where you track gifts to charity. In some cases, they're deductible. In some cases, they're not. You might want to talk to your tax accountant or that. Then we have cost of labor. That's not the direct cost. Again, this says here that there's two of them, one on the cost of goods sold and one on their expenses. So this would be cost of labor, like casual labor, stuff that's for the office, not necessarily for jobs. For subcontractors that are or, or labor employees that are directly working on projects for clients to solve issues, provide services, whatever, you want to pick this cost of goods sold, cost of labor category, and for office stuff, administrative stuff, uh, you know, someone that will work for a day and help you move stuff around, that would be what cost of labor is. It's more for administrative stuff. Then we have dues and subscriptions. That would be like if you subscribe to a monthly, quarterly, annual fee of any services that, um, that allow you to run your business better, for example. Then we have entertainment. This is actually not deductible anymore after 2017, but this would be like whatever you spend to entertain your employees. Long story short, pure entertainment is not deductible, but um, uh, business events for employees, like you know, holiday events that include meals and you know part of culture building events, that stuff can be uh, deductible. It just can't be entertainment for the owners. Okay, then we have entertainment meals, which is very similar, and you can read through them to see what explanation they give you. These two have some tax connotations. That's why it gets a little bit tricky. Then we have equipment rental. That's perfect for renting a, a copier, renting uh, computers, anything that you rent for the office, for administrative. Again, expenses is administrative, general, cost of goods sold is direct uh, for the job. So then we have um, finance costs that would be similar to interest expense or um, bank service charges. That you just get a finance cost to do any sort of transaction. So finance costs and interest paid should be very similar depending on on the context you have those options there then you have insurance there will be all sorts of insurance auto insurance healthcare insurance um general liability all that sort of thing uh, sometimes healthcare people put it on a different category just because it gets so tricky uh, but assuming that it's all deductible you can put it all in there then we have interest paid we talked about that just like finance costs legal and professional fees is when you pay a lawyer a consultant a, an accountant, you pay someone professional to help you run your business, or the general and administrative expenses, that would be your catch-all for your expenses account. That would be sort of a miscellaneous account. Um, you know, there's other that fall into the miscellaneous category, but that's one of the options that they give you, just like this one called other business expenses and other service costs. So in my opinion, these three that you see here, they're essentially the same thing. Uh, so it's up to you what you want to call it. Then you have payroll expenses. This would be the actual pages and, and uh, payroll and wages you pay to your employees, including payroll taxes, including workers' compensation, including uh, any additional uh, benefits. You can put them all on the payroll expense category. Then we have promotional meals, which is similar to the entertainment meals. Again, that, that has some tax connotations, but that would be like you doing business with a client, you taking out a major customer or a major party that's going to bring you customers and you're going to talk about business that sort of thing then we have rent or lease of buildings that's your rent the rent of your property of your office of your warehouse then we have repairs and maintenance that would be any expenses you make in order to repair your, your assets so you're going to repair equipment that you own you're going to repair 
the building that you lease. You're going to repair, you know, the walls, the, the, the floors. You're going to change a, 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 um, a door handle, something like that. That would be repairs and maintenance. So any repairs and maintenance expenses related to your administrative uh, infrastructure. Uh, or, or the assets that you own, for that matter. So your vehicle, your equipment, that sort of thing. Then shipping, freight, and delivery. This would be your your non-direct cost. This would be like shipping, freight, and delivery for administrative stuff. Um, it actually tells you here that if it's for direct customer stuff, that should be uh, the cost of goods sold. Here the explanation says you should do that to track products to customers, but I don't think you should. Expenses are general and administrative, not direct. So shipping and freight and delivery is for administrative expenses. Supplies and materials, this would be your non-direct supplies and materials for office consumption. Office supplies would be a perfect example of that. Taxes paid, that would be if you're actually paying uh, business taxes and you want to keep track of those taxes that you're paying. We're not talking about the personal taxes of the owner. For that, we do estimated payments. For that, we do the equity account. These are for actual business taxes that your business needs to pay. Then we have travel. Self-explanatory, some people create subcategories for travel, like airfare, lodging, transportation, that sort of thing. Then we have travel meals. It used to be that you used to keep track of travel meals, promotional meals, entertainment meals. Now, any meals are deductible, are 50% deductible anyway, so it doesn't matter really what account you use. Then we have unapplied cash bill payment expense, similar to the, un uh, which was the other one, I think it was under income, and we had unapplied uh, cash payment income that would be like the brother or the sister of this account that one here is for when you pay for a bill uh, let's say in December but it doesn't get created or entered until January of the next year QuickBooks needs to know where to put that unapplied bill payment so that's where it goes and then we have utilities such as your telephone gas electric water that sort of thing let's move on to other expenses and these are kind of like the last group of categories a lot of stuff that people put under other expense, it's some of the quasi personal and business expenses. With the exception of amortization, depreciation, exchange gain or loss, uh, those are like sort of truly, truly business expenses. However, gas and fuel, home office, other home office, other vehicle expense, parking and tolls, this is more for, again, the quasi personal, quasi business, and you wanna put them in a different category in other expenses because then you want to bring it to the attention of the accountant that this is not 100% business, this is like a 50-50 type of thing. So that's what all, all these other expenses are um, that you will do. But normally, as we mentioned earlier, if you have parking and tolls, if you have a vehicle expense, if you have utilities or vehicle insurance or all that stuff, that should go under your regular expense under the auto category, right? That's your regular business expenses. However, again, however, if it happens to be that you have these quasi-personal business expenses, that's what these will be for. And notice that none of these really have any explanations on their detail type. They were kind of just forced in there by Intuit saying, yeah, I put them all in there. So I think that these other expenses tend to be a, very confusing. And the only ones really you should pay, be paying attention to is amortization, depreciation, which is the actual expense of reduction of value of your assets, Exchange gain and loss, that's when you um, have bank accounts in multiple currencies and you keep track of, you know, the changes in value of that currency. And there's one more here, oh, right here, penalties and settlements. So this is when the business itself pays a penalty or a settlement and usually uh, that's not deductible. But you still track it as a business expense, but you end up not deducting it. So again, we're putting it on the other expense so uh, the accountant uh, can see it and it could bring it out to our attention. The only other account that wasn't mentioned here, um, and I'm gonna hit cancel just to avoid any confusion. The other account I mentioned here was Ask My Accountant. There's an account called Ask My Accountant. I don't know if I have it here, I don't, okay? So sometimes you create an account called Ask My Accountant, and that's when you're categorizing something and you have no clue where to put it. You put it under Ask My Accountant to kind of trigger the accountant to help you with that. Another account that's not mentioned here is this one called Uncategorized Asset, okay? QuickBooks automatically creates Uncategorized Asset, and in my opinion, you should never use it, never use it at all. As a matter of fact, if I was you, I would take that account and edit it and put do not use. And the reason for that is QuickBooks will randomly select that account and give it to you as an option, 
And you don't want to say, oh, sure, I'm categorized asset makes sense because every accountant I know, including myself, goes completely bonkers when they see stuff in uncategorized assets. And you can't delete it because it's a default account and this is just a technical thing that QuickBooks doesn't let you um, doesn't let you uh, delete it. So I just put there to remind me that I should never use it. The other one is one called reconciliation discrepancies. Let me see if that's here. Um, that's not here. So there might be an account called reconciliation discrepancies, which is when you reconcile the bank and you do it wrong, and there's a balance difference between uh, you know the, the amount that you have and the amount that you checked off during the reconciliation. It will post that error into that reconciliation discrepancies, and that's an expense account. There's also another one called uncategorized income or uncategorized expense. And anything with uncategorized next to it, uh, there it is, uncategorized income and uncategorized expense, that would be like if you don't know where to categorize some deposits coming in or some expenses, or even QuickBooks will suggest to put that, you're gonna choose those. Unfortunately, you can't delete them either. So if I try to delete them or make it active, it doesn't let me because it says online banking uses it to offer you uh, or, or tell you that they don't know what how to categorize these things. So uncategorized asset, uncategorized income, uncategorized expense, and reconciliation discrepancies are these strange additional accounts that get created by, by QuickBooks that you can delete and you just have to be aware that they exist. Woof, that was long, that was interesting. Uh, if you watched it up to this point, congratulations. Thank you, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for learning basic accounting. I think that's useful to a lot of people. Don't forget to check out my website where I explain that. And also if you um, want to purchase a chart of accounts I created, that's already preset, it's pre-organized, it has, uh, it has categories, parent categories, a lot of the things that we talked about organized in the exact fashion that I like to have it for my clients. Um, you can, you wanna click in there and you can buy my ultimate chart of accounts, whether you use QuickBooks Desktop or QuickBooks Online, there's basically an Excel file there that's import ready so you can import into your chart of accounts. Anyway, I hope this video was useful. Uh, drop a like, put some comments below if you think I didn't cover anything in particular, and I hope to see you on the next one.